At around 6 p.m. on the evening of April 26, 2009, a young woman buckled her 18-month-old son into his car seat in the parking lot of a strip mall in Snellville, Georgia. The woman was getting ready to make the roughly 25-minute drive back to her home when all of a sudden she was approached by a strange figure who came walking directly towards her from another area of the lot. Seconds later, witnesses heard what sounded like an argument, followed by the woman's cries for help. Before anyone could step in to see what was going on, however, things took a horrifying turn. A single gunshot rang out, and just as quickly as they had come, the mysterious figure began walking away. It was the beginning of an investigation that would stun and terrify the local community, one which would eventually lead authorities to an unexpected perpetrator with an incredibly twisted motive. Before we get to today's story, if you find our content interesting and informative and haven't already, we'd be honored if you'd take a second to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell. It helps you to keep up to date with our latest releases and helps us to keep up with that pesky, ever-changing YouTube algorithm. With that out of the way, let's get to the video. More than anything else, Heather Allen Strub was known as the kind of woman who cared deeply about other people. It didn't matter if you'd known her for 10 seconds or your whole life. Those closest to her say that she was sweet and kind to everyone that she encountered, but especially those that she chose to share the biggest parts of her life with. As one person close to her described it in an interview, quote, There were no friends with Heather. It was just family by blood or family by choice. Growing up in Conyers, Georgia, Heather had always been open to new people and experiences. She liked to get involved in local activities and events, especially ones that were held at her church. This is where she also met her future husband, Stephen Strube. The two of them both took part in the church's youth group as teens, and quickly became inseparable, marrying in 2004. When Heather decided to open up a flower shop after finishing school, family was also at the center of everything. Her mother and father, Buddy and Mary Allen, became her business partners. Stephen and his mother Joanna helped out with deliveries from time to time. And when Heather and Stephen welcomed their son Carson into the world in 2007, even he had a special place in the shop. Sadly, though, this picture of family bliss didn't last forever. Just a few months after the birth of their son, Heather learned that Stephen had been having a long-time affair with another woman. While Heather was shattered by the discovery, she was still interested in repairing the relationship. Part of this apparently had to do with her devout religious faith. She took the commitment of marriage extremely seriously and didn't really believe in divorce. However, Stephen had other ideas. After reportedly attending a single marriage counseling session, he said that he wanted a divorce and decided to stay with the woman who he'd been having an affair with. Realizing that she had no other option, Heather agreed to end the marriage, though this didn't stop things from getting even uglier between her and Stephen. Soon, they were locked in a prolonged custody battle over their young son. Eventually, the couple came to an arrangement. Heather would get primary custody of Carson, while Stephen would get to see him every other weekend. In the months that followed, Heather was still heartbroken, but according to friends and family, she never became jaded. Instead, she slowly began to pick up the pieces and get her life back on track. While single motherhood had its challenges, Heather was more than ready to rise to the occasion, fueled by the love that she had for Carson. She continued to work at the flower shop, though her parents took over its day-to-day -day operations. At the same time, she went back to school to pursue an associate's degree in business at Georgia Perimeter College, intent on building a better life for her and her son. It seemed like everything was going to work out for Heather, until a sudden tragedy changed everything. April 26, 2009 started like any other Sunday for Heather Allen Strube. The mother had just celebrated her 25th birthday a few days prior, but now it was time to prepare for another busy week of work and school. 
Late that afternoon, Heather finished up what she was doing and got into her red Cadillac Escalade. It was a custody exchange day, and she was supposed to meet up with Stephen at their prearranged spot so that she could get Carson and bring him home. The pair agreed to meet in the parking lot of a Target store, located in a strip mall just off of Georgia State Route 124. The area was roughly an equal drive time from Heather's home in Conyers and Stephen's place in Lilburn, and the two had met there several times. At around 6 p.m., Stephen pulled into the parking lot and drove up to Heather's red SUV. It was a quick exchange. Stephen handed Carson off to Heather, then got back into his car and drove away almost as quickly as he came. Heather buckled her 18-month-old son into his car seat in the back of the vehicle and was busy putting away a couple of things when out of nowhere she was approached from behind by a strange person. Startled, Heather closed the door and began to walk around to the driver's side door. However, this person ran in front of her and blocked the way with their body. An argument began, and Heather started yelling for help. But before anyone could come to her aid, it was too late. The mysterious person pulled out a handgun, shot Heather one time in the head, and then walked off. Terrified witnesses ran to see what had happened only to discover Heather lying in a pool of blood on the pavement. Frantic 911 calls were made, but sadly, it was too late. The 25-year-old mother was dead. Her son Carson was found still sitting in his car seat, physically unharmed, though obviously having witnessed everything that had just happened. After cordoning off the area, police began processing the scene. There wasn't much in the way of physical evidence, there were no fingerprints or DNA to analyze, and the shooter hadn't left behind any shell casings. However, an autopsy would later reveal that Heather had been killed by a single 38 caliber bullet, which had been fired at her forehead at close range. The only other thing authorities were confidently able to say was that the crime hadn't been a robbery. Heather's purse, wallet, and phone had been left untouched, and given the way that she'd been approached and attacked by the shooter, investigators believed that she had been targeted. The question was, by who and for what reason? It didn't take long for authorities to zero in on a potential suspect. While delivering the heartbreaking news about Heather's murder to her family, Detectives learned about the custody exchange between her and her estranged husband, Stephen. Friends and family members also told police about the contentious nature of their impending divorce. According to those closest to Heather, Stephen had treated her terribly during their marriage and had abused her both physically and emotionally. When she had discovered his affair and confronted him, they said that not only had he not been apologetic, he had done his best to make the divorce as hard on Heather as possible including drawing out the custody battle over Carson. This was actually one of the main reasons Heather had reportedly chosen the target parking lot as their meetup point for custody exchanges. The exchanges themselves had frequently turned ugly, to the point where Heather normally brought a person she trusted with her out of fear that something bad might happen to her. It was only recently that she had started coming to the meetups alone believing that the public nature of the location, the numerous surveillance cameras, and the daylight hour of the exchange would keep her safe. Sadly, it appeared that she had been wrong. After hearing all of this, and learning that Stephen Strube had been the last person to see Heather alive before she was murdered, police brought him in for questioning. While Stephen denied any involvement in the crime, he was quick to try and paint an unsympathetic picture of Heather. He said that, yes, their marriage hadn't worked out, but it was mostly her fault. He proceeded to rattle off a long list of grievances he had with Heather, such as that she didn't like to cook and clean, saying that he had only found this out after they got married and moved in together. Detectives were stunned by how callously Stephen spoke about his ex-wife just days after her brutal death. In fact, the only thing he appeared to be concerned about was how soon he could get his son back who had been placed in the care of Heather's parents after they obtained an emergency order. Buddy and Mary Allen had obtained the order on the grounds that Stephen was a danger to Carson. They argued that not only could he have been involved in Heather's murder, but also pointed to Stephen's prior criminal record. 
At the time, he was on parole, with a rap sheet that included burglary as well as a juvenile charge for making terroristic threats. Heather's family became even more concerned about Stephen when just a few days before her funeral, he apparently threatened to disrupt the service. Mary Allen later said in an interview that she was so disturbed by this that they had to have police present at the funeral on May 2nd so that they could be sure that Heather was laid to rest in peace. She also said that Stephen never once offered his condolences about their daughter's murder. When police spoke to members of Stephen's family, however, they described the situation in a completely different way. Stephen's mother, Joanna Hayes, described her son as gentle and kind claiming that she had never once witnessed him doing or saying anything inappropriate to Heather. She said that her son had simply done his best to get out of a broken marriage. While detectives tried to wade through the increasingly bad blood between the Allen and Strube families, Stephen remained the primary person of interest in the case. After all, he had been at the scene right before Heather's murder, and the timing and targeted nature of the shooting seemed incredibly suspicious. That was until a new piece of evidence sent the investigation in a different direction. Though authorities had virtually no physical evidence to go on in the Heather Allen Strube case, given the public nature and daylight timing of the crime, what they did have were plenty of eyewitnesses. Using these accounts, plus footage from two video surveillance cameras at the scene, they were able to piece together the moments before and directly after the shooting. According to witnesses, the mysterious suspect had been standing behind some bushes on an island in the parking lot prior to Heather and Stephen's custody exchange. As soon as this was complete, the killer had walked quickly towards Heather's vehicle, ambushing her as she finished getting Carson buckled into his car seat. While neither of the cameras at the scene had directly captured the shooting, they had obtained footage of the suspect walking quickly away from the scene after the fact. Footage of the perpetrator was grainy, though it was enough to establish that they had fled on foot, as well as confirm the strange details of their appearance. Witnesses described the suspect as a white male with a slight build and a distinctive walk. His posture was sort of hunched, and he walked with very little bending at the knee. Bizarrely, the man appeared to be young. Some would have even guessed that he was a teenager, except that he had a large overgrown black mustache and a big head of frizzy black hair. The hair in particular was something that many witnesses pointed out as being odd. Using this description, police created a composite sketch that was released to the public. This wasn't all that surveillance footage revealed, though. In addition to showing the suspect walking away from the scene, Cameras also recorded Stephen arriving and leaving the parking lot in his vehicle. Due to the timing of this, it wasn't possible for him to have been the shooter. It looked as though he now had an ironclad alibi. That being said, authorities weren't yet ready to discount Stephen's involvement in the crime entirely. It seemed that whoever this mysterious suspect was, they had knowledge of he and Heather's custody exchange and had arrived at the scene ahead of time to wait patiently for an opportunity to strike. Investigators theorized, therefore, that the shooting could have been a prearranged hit. As detectives were busy combing through the footage and interviewing witnesses, another person came forward saying that they had information for police. This witness, a truck driver named Daryl Myers, would provide a crucial missing piece of the puzzle. Daryl told investigators that on the weekend of Heather's murder, he had noticed a strange person in the parking lot of the hotel where he was staying. The hotel, which at the time was called the Crestwood Suites, was located directly behind the strip mall where the shooting had taken place. Daryl said that both the day before and the day of the murder, he had noticed this mysterious individual sitting in a white pickup truck in the hotel parking lot. It looked to him like they were intensely scoping out the adjacent Target parking lot and were taking pictures of the area. Daryl said that he remembered the person because of their strange appearance. They had frizzy black hair, which he likened to a, quote, Sonny and Cher type wig. He claimed that the second time he had seen the suspicious person, they had turned around and noticed that they were being watched. When they did, they immediately sped out of the parking lot. 
Prior to this, police had already been entertaining the theory that the suspect had been wearing a disguise at the time of the shooting. This was due to the amount of comments witnesses had made about the killer's hair and mustache, leading authorities to believe that they had been fake. However, it was Daryl's comments about the suspect's vehicle that really intrigued detectives. He said that the white pickup was an older model Ford F-150, with distinctive black molding that ran across the bottom on either side. It turned out that police knew someone who drove exactly this kind of vehicle. It was Steven Stroop's mother, Joanna Hayes. Before confronting Joanna directly, police knew that they needed more to go on. So once again, they brought in Stephen for questioning. This time, detectives played Stephen the surveillance footage they had obtained of the suspect, leaving the crime scene on foot after the shooting. At first, Stephen looked confused as to why they were showing him the tape, but after a few seconds, his demeanor completely changed. Investigators watched as a simultaneous expression of terror and understanding seemed to wash over his face. Detectives asked Stephen if he recognized the suspect. He eventually broke down and said that it was his mother. She may have been wearing a disguise, but she hadn't been able to hide her distinctive walk. After making this admission, Stephen agreed to call his mother in the interrogation room. In a tearful phone call, he confronted her saying that the perpetrator looked like her and walked like her, before asking her point-blank if she was responsible for Heather's death. Joanna denied everything, inquiring whether Stephen had shared this information with police. When he said that he had, she responded flatly, saying she guessed she should prepare for police to come and question her then. When Joanna was interviewed, she continued to deny everything, claiming that she had a good relationship with Heather and had no reason to want her dead. She also claimed that she had an alibi, saying there was a receipt in her truck from the specific day of the murder that proved that she had been at a Wendy's 65 miles away. She said that she had been driving to her parents' house at the time of the shooting and had left her home between 5.15 and 5.30 p.m. Authorities were suspicious of this alleged alibi, as it was extremely specific and Joanna reportedly brought it up unprompted. It sounded to detectives like something that she might have planned ahead of time. Sure enough, when police recreated the circumstances, driving to the exact same Wendy's on the same day of the week at the same time, they found that it took an hour and 19 minutes. This meant that at the latest, Joanna should have arrived at the Wendy's at around 6.50 p.m. that day. Instead, her receipt was time-stamped 7.19 p.m. This meant that there was almost an entire half hour of her time right in the window of the murder that was unaccounted for. When police obtained a search warrant for Joanna's truck, they uncovered two other pieces of evidence. There were trace amounts of gunshot residue found on the steering wheel and a long synthetic black fiber consistent with a wig. Finally, when authorities spoke to Joanna's ex-husband, they learned that at the time of the murder, she owned a Lady Rossi revolver that she carried everywhere with her. The gun was a 38 caliber, the same kind that had been used to kill Heather. In October of 2009, Joanna Hayes was arrested and charged with murder. When the case went to trial in May of 2011, prosecutors knew that they would be fighting an uphill battle. The charges against Joanna Hayes relied mostly on circumstantial evidence, which the defense was quick to point out. They also argued that most of the witnesses present at the time of the shooting had described a male perpetrator, not a female one. To top it all off, by this point, Stephen Strube had recanted his earlier statement about his mother's involvement in the crime and instead took the stand in her defense. Prosecutors argued, meanwhile, that while several witnesses had thought the shooter had been a man, all of the descriptions they had been given of the suspect were consistent with Joanna and her disguise. Some of those that had initially believed that the suspect was a man had since changed their opinions after seeing photos of Joanna Hayes, and even those that hadn't had commented about how strange the suspect looked. Prosecutors pointed to the holes in Joanna's alibi, 
the evidence found in her vehicle, and the fact that she owned a gun that was consistent with the murder weapon. While this weapon had never been recovered, police introduced a witness that spoke to a possible reason why. The witness, a former acquaintance of Joanna's, said that while working with her a few months before the murder, she had spoken about committing the perfect crime. This witness went on to describe Joanna's plan. She said that she would act alone, give a credit card of hers to an unwitting accomplice to establish an alibi, and would use a gun purchased from a day laborer. Joanna said that she had previously worked in construction and that it was common to find firearms on construction sites saying that she had already purchased at least three weapons this way. She stated that after this, she would use power tools to grind down or melt the gun, which she would then toss into a lake. According to the witness, Joanna even spoke about the type of vehicle that she would use. She said that she and her ex-husband owned a lime green minivan, a silver Dodge truck, and a white Ford F-150. She reasoned that the minivan was too noticeable because of its color, and the Dodge was too distinctive because of a dent in its tailgate. This left the white pickup. On top of this, family members and friends of Heather testified that prior to her murder, Heather had been afraid of Joanna. She said that as soon as she learned of their divorce, she had been incredibly cruel towards her, verbally abusing her any time they would see each other. At one point, Heather even confided in a friend that she feared that Joanna might attack her. Heather's mother, Mary, said that she thought she knew why. It turned out that whenever her grandson, Carson, spent time with his father, Joanna was the one who primarily took care of him. In fact, Mary claimed that during the initial phase of the divorce, it seemed like Stephen didn't care all that much about custody of his son. That was, until his mother got involved. Mary said that she now believed Joanna was the one pulling the strings behind the scenes, because she worried that when the divorce was finalized, she would be cut off from her grandson. Others testified that despite claiming that she was on good terms with Heather, Joanna had been very vocal about her dislike for her. In fact, during one of her police interviews, she had told police that she hated Heather and didn't think that she was a good enough mother to raise her grandson. Using this, prosecutors put forward a motive. They argued that Joanna had planned and carried out Heather's murder in order to remove her from the picture. She figured that once she was gone, Stephen would get primary custody, effectively meaning that Joanna would get to raise Carson herself. The most effective piece of evidence prosecutors presented, however, was the tape of Stephen reacting to the surveillance footage taken from the Target parking lot on the day of the murder particularly the part where he broke down and admitted that he believed the shooter was his mother. During their deliberation, the jury reviewed the footage in its entirety. After four days, on May 18th, 2011, they found Joanna Hayes guilty of murder. She was sentenced to life in prison with no parole for 30 years. Following the trial, Joanna Hayes appealed her sentence, arguing that there wasn't enough evidence presented for a conviction. The Supreme Court of Georgia disagreed, upholding the decision in 2013. At the time of this recording, Joanna remains incarcerated at the Pulaski State Prison in Hawkinsville, Georgia. To this day, she reportedly continues to maintain her innocence. According to the most up-to-date sources we could find, it appears that Carson was raised by his maternal grandparents, Mary and Buddy Allen, after the trial. We hope that wherever he is, he and his family are doing well, and are continuing to keep the memory of his mother alive. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. 
All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.